Greetings, I'm John Duvall and this is the Truth Factor Discussion. We'd like to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for this time period of discussing the Word of God, of factoring the truth into our daily lives. It's always good when we come together to study the Word of God in this capacity. Gentlemen, it's good to be here with you today. Daniel, let's start with you. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing wonderful, brother. I appreciate uh, all those who have uh, joined us as well, and I would encourage you to grab a Bible and, and turn to First John chapter 5. That's where our discussion will take place today, and we uh, look forward to any comments and questions that you have. Absolutely. Royce, how are you doing? Good morning, brethren, and uh, everyone who happens to be there. Uh, what I'm doing, if you're looking over in your, uh, uh, in your chat uh, room, or the chat roll over there, uh, what I'm doing is I'm adding there, I have to do it in spurts, oops, the, uh, the comment in the Net Bible, um, which actually is a, a well-presented uh, uh, discussion of verse 7, or, or the longer reading of verse 7 in the First John chapter 5, so just in case. But uh, while I continue to do that, you guys go ahead and I'll turn it over to Tom. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I'm doing fine as well. Uh, we concluded a, a wonderful gospel meeting last week with Randall Duvall, who, looking on the chat, he is not with us today because he's up in central California, or northern central California, preaching uh, actually two gospel meetings this week, along with his brother Alan. They were with us for a few moments last week. Like I said, we had a wonderful gospel meeting. Uh, the sermons that he preached are available on our website, www.roseavenue.org. So if you're interested in that, they're on the very front page. You can go uh, download them and listen to them there. Uh, as to the the class that, or the our study this morning, as always, it is good to be a part of this. Um, Royce was mentioning he's putting some things in the chat room, and I know typically Paul tells us that if you want to participate, that you you can join in with the uh, by way of the chat roll that is associated with this program. So we welcome your comments. Just uh, just uh, sign in in one of the various formats that's available there below the below the chat roll and we'd love to have your comments. Okay, all right, very good. And that is absolutely true. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and so you may be wondering, um, especially if you've joined us just at the start of the discussion, if you've been with us for the last 15 minutes, you know what we're talking about. But you may be wondering what is this information that Royce is pasting into the chat room and we're going to reveal that here in just a couple of minutes because it is very pertinent to what we are about to look at. Um, but, you know, our goal as Christians is to study the Bible, is to study the Word of God. Now, we, unlike the very first century when Paul would write his letters and, and the various gospel accounts were written and recorded, they're all written in one language, and they would, people would copy them and take them around and so forth. But at some point, that message had to be taken to other languages and varying translations had to develop so that people still would have access to the same gospel truth. And here we are some not quite 2,000 years later. Here we are with many, many different translations of the same Word of God. And there are times when you look at the differing translations that you can, off, you can <laughs> step on some toes um, if you don't understand why there are differences in translations and, and come to an, an understanding about that. We had some members one time in Lawton, very sweet elderly couple. They were not King James Version onlyers in that believing the Holy Spirit had directly inspired the King James translators, but they felt like the King James translation was you know, the, the best translation. Well, there was a, a younger man teaching the adult Bible class, and he was reading from the New American Standard Version. And he read something from one of Paul's epistles. I don't remember which one it was. might have been Ephesians. And the sweet lady, she raised her hand. She says, I'm sorry, but my Bible doesn't say that. He says, doesn't say what? And she said, well, what you just said. He says, well, what does your Bible say? And she read it, and he looks down at his, and he goes, hmm, that is different. I wonder why. You know, and um, so needless to say, not long after that, we had some couples of lessons, you know, looking at the difference in translations. But 
when we study the Bible, we have to look to the context of what is being said and recognize that if there are differences in translations, that we don't need to get too caught up in that unless it brings in a doctrinal divide there with that. Now, I say all that to say this. In 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 6, and what we'll do in just a moment here, we're going to read from two uh, popular translations, and it'll illustrate one of the uh, the differences that I uh, am talking about there um, in, in what I just said. Before we do that, before we illustrate this, any thoughts or comments, gentlemen? No, sir. Okay. I'll tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and read the text. Let me... Um, uh, actually, I would like to make one statement. Go ahead. Um, that'll give me a chance to get this prepped over here. Sure. Uh, the, the comment I'd like to make is that what I find fascinating is that in, in all the study of, of textual criticism or, or what verses or, or words may uh, have not been in the original, it's fascinating to me that in all of that discussion, nothing major doctrinally is... Uh, is wrong. There's nothing that uh, where one passage says that Jesus rose from the dead and another one that says he didn't. There's no passage uh, or there's no textual critic that would say there's no passage uh, about baptism that saves. So all of the things about salvation or our belief in Jesus and, and the things that we need to do to be saved and go to heaven, all none of those are touched. Anytime that one of those passages may be a, a question there are several other passages that say the same thing. So I, I just wanted to point that out at the beginning of our study. Um, we're not trying to challenge any doctrinal truths that are found in other scriptures, but merely just see what this specific text says. Right. And, John, yeah, exa you, and, do you mind if I add something to that, John, go before ahead. you uh, go ahead? I think that is a profoundly important principle to realize because what that verifies is that very early on there was a consistent body of teaching that that even though there may have entered copyist errors or some elucidations on a text even those elucidations even those copies uh, copyist errors uh, or insertions indicate just how strongly uh, uh, common or, or how, how, how strongly unified was the body of teaching that existed at that time as opposed to say in our day where the, there are so many variant teachings on the, on, the, on the scripture. I mean even such things that we were talking about kind of casually just a little bit ago, marriage, divorce, and remarriage and even among bro those who are supposedly brothers and sisters in Christ, you have such wide variations of teaching. You did not have that Back in those early days, that is strong, profound testimony for the unity of the Scripture. Okay. All right. Tom? Yeah, and, and yeah, the observation that I was going to make, you know, uh, based on Daniel's comment, you know, talking about how not, none of these variants really affect any doctrinal issue, the only thing that's, that becomes a question is whether or not you can use a particular Scripture to justify a doctrine. That's... and. Uh, that's really the challenge that you deal with. In other, in other words, uh, if you address textual differences and so on, or if you're addressing a particular subject, you want to make sure that you're using the proper verses and not taking something out of its context because it proves some point that you want to make. Yeah. yeah. So, um, right. and, and think about this. Yeah, let me finish it before the, the comments come in the chat room. Yeah. You don't have to quote verse to teach truth. Right. Okay. I mean, now, we should. Don't misunderstand me. But I can tell someone, look, the Bible says you need to believe and be baptized in order to be saved. You know, yeah. I am teaching truth, and I'm not quoting the verse. I can say, you know, the, the, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, they, they all agree. They are in fellowship. They are working together as one and not have to quote a scripture to prove it unless someone says, where does the Bible teach it? And if it's there, then it's truth. And if it's not, then it's not. Obviously, you know, so the, right. the, the truth is going to be the truth. And mm -hmm. um, and so and, and it's going back to what Daniel said and, and all the little problems that, that there that there are among some of these the, these uh, what we've been looking at here. The truth still remains and is found, you know, without with 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 diligent study. Um, 
And one, one more point, and we'll illustrate this. There was a preacher, not a preacher, a member of the church, some years back when I was in Jonesboro, he was teaching the adult Bible class, and I was teaching one of the younger classes. And he was studying through John, and he came to the uh, the, the incident, the account of the um, the, the healing at the, the well there by Bethesda. And um, there there is, of course, some, some issues with the legitimacy of that particular text in, in the various uh, extant copies down through the years. But his mistake was, he said in an adult Bible class, this is not in the Bible. Okay? Now, when you stand up for an adult Bible class and you say, this is not supposed to be in the Bible, that will get people what? riled up. And well, um, That is a dangerous position. Yeah. And so yes. I had people coming up to me and say, you know, Brother Duval, brother, brother so-and-so said that this isn't supposed to be in the Bible. What does he mean by that? You know. And so you have to be careful how you approach this in the teaching process. And, and, and now you you have to clean up the other guy's excessive statement. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's illustrate this real quick. And of course, in the in the chat room, we'd love to hear your questions and comments. Don't hesitate to sign in, even as guest, and uh, drop those in. And, and the guys will help me monitor that. And we'll bring them in. But I'm going to read from the New King James translation, starting there in verse six, and I'm going to read down through verse eight, starting there with verse six. Let me bring this up here. <clears throat> and boy, that did it to me last week. Hang on a minute. Sorry about that. Let's go that route. There we go. So, New King James translation, beginning in verse 6 of 1 John chapter 5. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. Uh, we're going to stop there for the sake of this illustration, and then we will look at the, the text in and of itself here in just a couple of minutes. Daniel, I'm going to bring up the English Standard Version now, and if you would read that for us. Sure. <clears throat> it says, starting in verse 6, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. Okay, now if you were to hear, if, if you study from the New King James, or reading from the King James, New King James only, and you're listening to Daniel preach a sermon, and he says, turn over in your Bibles too, and he reads this, and you're following along, you're going to say, wait a minute. You skipped a verse, Daniel. <laughs> or, and I'll say that because in many instances it would kind of be that way. Uh, mm -hmm. More people are starting to read, and it's not just the ESV, it's the New American Standard Version, um, the NIV, and um, others as well, you know, that, that we see the difference in there. And we have to be able to understand why there is a difference. Is there a problem with the difference? And does that difference alter the doctrine that is taught within um, the scripture? Description, yeah. You know, and we're and that's what we're going to talk about here today. So let's see. Let's first look at verse six because I think understanding verse six in the context is crucial to understanding why some view verse seven as not having been there. If that that can be a good way of starting to look at this. Sounds good to me. Okay. All right. Notice here that he says that this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Okay. Yeah. Not and, only by and, water. Yeah. Oh, oh, and, and I was just going to say to put that in the, the context for uh, since we discussed verses 1 through 5 last week, uh, John is challenging those who are denying that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay. So. All right. So. Yeah. All right. Very good. Very good point there. So he came not only by water, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. So let's let's talk a minute about the first part of that, how that he says he came by water and blood, not only by water, but by water and blood. Who wants to start this discussion? I don't mind. Uh, I don't mind starting it. Um, Go ahead, Royce. I, yeah. I, I think it's really interesting that that John lays down what I believe to be a seminal truth. Jesus Christ is the one 
who came by water and blood. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. It's interesting that he introduces it. He came by water and blood. Um, one could say, well, why doesn't he include the virgin birth here? Why, okay. why is that not significant testimony? Uh, and, of course, it does constitute significant testimony at, at one level. But I believe that the point that, that John is making right here relates to the public entrance of Christ upon what well, we might talk about the personal ministry of Christ, but mm -hmm. the public entry of Christ uh, in into the context whereby others would be able to see and note and then acknowledge by means of the recorded information about him here is the testimony that he is the Son of God. And incidentally, I believe the water here relates to his baptism, at which point, as we see in the Gospel records, uh, the voice comes from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. There is divine testimony. Then, of course, the blood would be, and I, I believe it relates to the cross, the shedding of his, uh, of his blood. And you might use as a corollary to that the statement, by the centurion, truly, this man was the Son of God. Okay. Uh, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. Right. And then, okay. of course, you have the Spirit's testimony. The Spirit is one who testifies because the Spirit is true. Okay. Right. While, and, while Royce and, covers up his camera to let it re readjust on the brightness there, we'll throw it to Tom. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I, and I, I was going to say, also along with this dealing with the water and the blood, Recall that Jesus, when he was speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, mm -hmm. you know, he tells him, you have to be born again. And, of course, that leads to the discussion, how can one be born again when he is old? Can he enter into his mother's womb a second time? And Jesus answers in verse 5, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And, again, I, I believe that when Jesus speaks of the water there, he has reference to baptism. Mm -hmm. You know, and he's saying you have to obey the gospel, and if if that's the proper rendition of First uh, John three five, or excuse me, John three five, then uh, I think that ties into our verse six here. But but with with Jesus, and I, this goes back to what Royce was saying there, and Daniel, I, let me know if you agree with this here that the reference to the water wasn't just baptism in general, but when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist right. at the start of his ministry. Correct. Or Correct. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And that's what you're talking about, Tom, too. It, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm just making the point that the word water, because you know, I, I've, I've heard some who teach faith only, they will take uh, John 3, 5, and they'll say that that water is a reference to the natural birth process. And yeah, then, the spirit, then the spirit. And so I'm just making the point, you know, Jesus is emphasizing using the word water there as a reference to baptism. And that ties into John's part here. And incidentally, it's the same author. Yep, it, right. uh, one thing I, I like about this passage, too, is, is when you look at those specific events, they really <laughs> symbolize uh, oh, yeah. much of Jesus' ministry. For instance, his immersion was his submission to the will of the Father, and that encompasses his whole ministry. His crucifixion symbolizes his whole passion in his ministry that he had throughout. And if we could share it in Jesus and, and those kind of things, we would be much better off, that's for sure. And... Uh, another thing to note, I think, is that, um, for instance, John 19 and verse 34, when there's water and blood that come out of Jesus' side, mm -hmm. I know many people who do believe this is a connection to that. Uh, my personal conviction is that it is not, but I wouldn't argue with somebody who does. Um, that's, that's, you know, your personal opinion. Uh, but I think something uh, that, that I really like about this passage is that... Uh, I lost my thought there for a second. <laughs> Come back to me. Do, the, do a loop. On the point, can I make an observation on the point that Daniel was just making about sure. those who find in this a connection uh, to the, the water and the blood that came from the side of Jesus? Mm -hmm. John's statement expressly is that it was not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. What yeah. we have, we, we constitute, we have... Two specific testimonies here: uh, the the uh, the water and the blood that came from the side of Christ. While I can see that someone might, uh, in a 
you know, in a very casual or a very light comparison, see that and, and say, well, that obvious is it. We need to understand that we talk, we're talking about two individual testimonies to Christ coming to do his work. There is the statement of the Father, this is my beloved mm -hmm. Son. You can't miss that one. And, and sorry, my comment that I was going to make is, is, is along those lines in the sense that uh, one, you know, symbolizes the immersion, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. One symbolizes his death, the end of Jesus' ministry. But this was very important to dispel what the Gnostics were teaching. The Gnostics believed that, G, that Jesus Christ came into the body or the Christ came into Jesus' body at immersion. So the person before immersion was not divine, and they believed that Jesus departed from that body before the crucifixion and had no place in the death of Christ. So this was important to uh, dispel that teaching from the Gnostics to just show the, the fact that Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, went through the crucifixion. So often not something that uh, is a doctrine that we address today, but that was something they were battling back then. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's a very good, very good point. All, all of you, very well stated. As a matter of fact, in in the chat room, uh, Brian kind of holds to the um, same thought here as what we're looking at. He says, "Agree with Tom. The water must mean baptism. I suspect that the absence of the blood in John three is because it had not yet been shed, which is a very, very interesting point. I uh, do keep in mind that y'all, that y'all, that, <laughs> that the stream by the time you see it is about a minute, almost a minute behind us. So if it seems like that we are hitting your comment later, you know." four or five minutes later than when you put it in there, that's just why, because it finally comes up, we see it, and then we bring it into our discussion. Um, other, streaming service is, other streaming services are a little bit faster, like the Ustream, but, but YouTube does some extra processing to the stream, and so it ultimately delays the live, live feed there. Um, Royce Barrick is a fellow that I know from uh, England. Oh. From England. Yeah, and uh, or know him via the internet. So. I could have said Beowulf, I suppose. Anyway. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. So with that being said, let's then kind of come back here to our text. Notice he says there, and it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. Now, Royce, you mentioned this a while ago, and I think probably one of the you other guys did as well. When when Jesus was in the water, he came up out of the water. At his baptism, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like as a dove. All right, we see the Holy Spirit in a manner of speaking. Would you not say that he was bearing witness? But, well, yeah. Oh, that's exactly right. Yeah. That's Excuse exactly me. right. Excuse right. you. Uh, <laughs> bring me a Kleenex. I got to clean my monitor. <laughs> then, and then when when you jump forward oh. to his death, think yeah. about what happened at his death. That's exactly right. You know, the, the ground shook and and the, the, the sun was hidden, and then his his overcoming of death, although he was, as Roman says, we need to believe that he was raised by the Father. We see undoubtedly within there the working of the Holy Spirit, and so we see both miraculous events bearing witness to who he was. Right. Okay. Would, would that seem to be a reasonable explanation of the latter uh, part yes, of verses? I agree, brother. Uh, that would seem to be a reasonable one. The question may arise, uh, is the point of the Spirit is the one who testifies related to his miracles, which of course brings you back into the context of the Gospel of John, where Jesus says, I'm doing the works of the Father. So you might want to be careful that you don't just throw that in there, yeah. that Christ is working these miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit, which may, which may bring us into the uh, was Jesus' divine discussion of 20 years ago? But. Oh man, yeah, I, I remember you know not you know 96, 98, early 2000s. I mean this this stuff was pretty pretty well debated by my brethren. Yeah. Um, what look at how look at how profoundly fundamental these statements are. Jesus is the one who came by water and blood, not by the water only. He wants to drive that point home. Uh, I don't see, uh, uh, D Daniel brings this up from time to time, but I don't see so much a refutation of, of uh, Gnostic theory here. 
I, I think it anticipates that. I think it, it, it lays the groundwork so that when this false teaching appears, uh, then then it, it answers it specifically. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. Then the spirit is the one the spirit is the one who testifies. Yeah. Because the spirit is the truth. Look at how how profoundly fundamental that affirmation is. I mean, how many of us can stand up and say, you know what, that's the truth. Well, well you, you know, know what? what? There are certain things. If I teach them, that's the truth. If I teach Jesus is the Christ, I'm teaching the truth. It's that simple. If I'm teaching that baptism is unto the remission of sin, that's the truth. I don't care what you may want to make of faith, but that's the truth. Think, and that's exactly right. Think for just a moment what the Hebrew writer says, kind of along those same lines, Royce, in Hebrews chapter, oh, uh, chapter three, roughly. But where he says, and, and I'll bring this over for everyone to see at home, he says, and we're jumping into this, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing uh, witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. I mean, when Jesus was on this earth, the apostles were able to do things via the Holy Spirit to confirm their authority. And after Jesus left, the apostles were able to do things via the Holy Spirit to confirm their authority. And so the Holy Spirit serves, stands as, as a witness, a, a testimony to whom Jesus was and to the authority that he had from his Father. Right. Just side thought there. Okay, so any other thoughts on that? All right, let's jump back to the text now. I want to skip verse 7. If you're studying from a King James or New King James translation, uh, so that we can complete the thought that is began there in verse 6. And you, you'll see as we go through why we say that there. All right. He then says in verse 8, and let's bring this up on the screen. He says, And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree as one. Now the reason why I skipped verse 7 is because notice the reference to the Spirit, the water, and the blood. John says that these three things, these three things seen in verse 6 there, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, these three witnesses agree as one. One. To whom Jesus Christ actually is. Yeah, verse, All right. in, any thoughts, Royce? Yeah, ver verse 8, referring back up to verse uh, 6. Yes, in the King James and New King James translations, yeah. 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 All right, any, any other thoughts on that? And, of course, you've got that uh, the question that arises out of verse 7, but of course I, I put that uh, running comment there out of the net, uh, the net Bible. No, I, I, think, I think John's yeah. coming back to that. Yeah, Yeah, we're going to hop back to verse 7 here in just a okay. second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mainly, mainly what we're looking at right now is the context of 6 and 8 and mm -hmm. the point that, that's being made there about these three, the blood, water, and the spirit, agree to the deity of Christ, who he was, what he did, and what he is still today. Well, then let me, uh, that being true then, or, or that, that point that you're making being so, uh, it's, it's Im imperative that we see here that this is not the testimony of men. That's right. This is the testimony of God, divine testimony. How much more, how much stronger is the testimony of God than the testimony of even two legally required uh, you witnesses, you know, Deuteronomy 17 establishes that in order mm -hmm. to uh, to establish a matter, it is required that there be two witnesses. You, then Jesus refers back to that same thing in uh, John chapter 8. Uh, Even in your law, it's written that the testimony of two men uh, can be verified. I testify on my, on my behalf, and so does the Father who sent me. You know, even if you use the example that Jesus himself uses of John the Baptist, giving testimony, it still comes back to his baptism and the fact that the Father said, this is my beloved Son. If the individual denies the testimony of the Father, that he is the Son of God, that he is coming to flesh, he is denying the truth of God. Yeah. Um, and, and verse 9 brings that point out very well, Royce. Correct, and, and we'll, and, we'll anticipate it in a second. Yeah. 
And, and I like the witnesses because it, I, I don't think this is maybe the spirit. I, I don't know. I can't go into the mind of God. But I, I read it in such a way that it's like, oh, you want two witnesses? I'll see your two and raise you one. And by the way, they're all divine. And, uh, and how would you like to have the spirit as your witness in a courtroom? Uh, my, wife start, my wife started laughing at you. <laughs> you know, I'll see you two and raise you one. Yeah. Uh, and, which, reminds uh, me, which reminds me of the time that uh, one of the elders in Irving, Texas, asked me if I thought Paul was a drunkard. And I said, I don't, a drunkard? No. He said, well, you think he drank because you said something about you don't see the Apostle Paul pride in his beer. Uh, <laughs> but, but to clarify that, that's B-I-E-R, not B-E-E-R. <laughs> I-E-R, which, uh, you know, in his... Uh, in his casket, you know, he's not crying. Yeah, yeah anyway. But. I uh, and and how much? Just think of it. If you were in court and you were on trial and somebody was had a case against you, wouldn't you love to have the Holy Spirit at your defense? That's what Jesus has in His corner at this yes. moment. Maybe the strongest point here on verse eight is the very last statement there. The three are of one accord, or the three agree. Okay. Yeah. You know? We're not talking about testimony that can be discussed. There is nothing open open to question about this. Exactly. This is an absolute agreement in the witnesses. You can't refute one witness. That's right. Or two, or three. Yeah. Now, one one quick thought. When we see the the, the reference to the blood and the water, we've already talked about this a while ago. It's because of what they represent. The water represents the beginning of his teaching with the approval of God, and the blood represents his death upon the cross of Calvary. So the if you start... I, I would just clarify, his baptism by John the Baptist. Yeah, his the beginning of his ministry and the acceptance right. of God, and the end of it with his death on the cross of Calvary and the acceptance of God is what he's fundamentally referencing as far as the blood and water agreeing with the Spirit. Is there a... Is there an application in the statement, it is the Spirit who testifies that brings you and me back to the Word of God, that, that men sure, were sure. inspired by the Holy Spirit, yeah. and thus the Spirit's testimony to you and me that tells us, for instance, of his baptism, yeah, that yeah. tell us of his crucifixion, that it, it, the, the effect of that upon us is a conviction because the Spirit comes to convict yeah. that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The, the, uh, something I think contextually that we'll get into in verse 7, but I, I just want to say while we're talking about witnesses, is you have three here. That's a very important number in, in this society, three. Taking the New King James standpoint, what, did you, what do you have when you add them all together? You get six. Everybody knows that in Revelation, six is not a, a great number. In this culture, it was just short of completion, you know, just short of perfection. If you add all the witnesses in the New King James Version, you have six witnesses, and that's never a symbolic number that's any got any positive side effects to it. Actually, wouldn't you have five, because the Holy Spirit would be listed as listed twice? Well, you would add the three and the three times two, so... Yeah, but the thing is, is it's three in heaven and three on earth. Yeah. But, but that's... Yeah. But I'm saying if you add them together, you get six. <laughs> I know. So. I mean, yeah, sorry, uh, Tom's point is correct. If you look at the longer reading yeah. of verse 7, the, the point there is in heaven. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's three in heaven and three on earth. So, I mean, but but anyways, we'll, well get to that. Let's go ahead and, and do that. Um, some First off, someone's looking at this and why are you guys skipping over verse 7? We're going to talk about that. But Okay, you guys take care. I'm gone. <laughs> Thanks, Royce. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Um, but I do want it to be understood that we firmly believe that there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we believe Absolutely. that these three are one in purpose, one in work, and the Bible teaches the existence of the th of three essentially as the Godhead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and and I'll even go a step further and say it is a matter of fellowship. Yes, it it, it is. It, it absolutely is. Now, with that being said, and let's take it even further. It is the Father who testifies, and Jesus Jesus said, "I do the works of the Father." Yep. yep. Jesus Himself says, "I testify of myself," even though that doesn't mean anything to you. I can testify of myself, but I won't testify of myself. 
And then you have the testimony of the Spirit. So we ought to be careful that we don't refute the truth that verse that the extended reading of verse seven right. That's actually right. teaches. But here again, what that does is it establishes that it, even at that early day, there was an absolutely fundamental unity of teaching. That's right. Okay. So look here at verse seven. Let me bring this up on the screen. Then, all right. Verse seven, he says, "For there are three that bear witness in heaven." the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Um, I almost would have had a better issue with this verse, and I don't have a great issue with it, if you if you would, but I would have much rather seen this verse moved to after verse 8. Okay, it, you know, who, To me, within the context, this thought, if it's original, would be viewed as a parenthetical statement because it interrupts the thought began in verse 6 and that is continued in verse 8. If it was added by a, 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 trans, a transcription or a writer at some point um, at some point in the history there, copies. The, a copy, thank you, then he should have put it after verse 8. It would have made much more sense to have plugged verse, that statement about the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, put it after verse 8 before he goes on to talk about the witness of men. You know, it would have made more sense to be plugged in there. Unless he was a, unless he was attempting to establish the priority of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit okay. as one. That's right. Now, here's the great question, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, but if you've already studied this, you'll know why. Why, and I'm going to throw this to, let's start with Royce, because he's done the propensity of, of pasting stuff into the chat room, which we're not going to read, but... Uh, out loud, that is. Oh, but Royce, I kind of. We shouldn't don't have time. Yeah, go, go ahead and give us a brief explanation, and then I'll throw it to Daniel to fill in anything if he needs to. Explain why some translations have verse seven, some don't. Why some people reject it, and then some people, of course, you know, are opposed to that rejection. That, that's, yeah, that's, actually a, that's actually a tall order, but let, let me just clarify. <laughs> um, we would not have that question had not it appeared in the King James. I believe what happens is that the King James, I believe the King James translators favored what what they believed was the translation of Erasmus. Mm -hmm. What we do, what we don't see in their acceptance of that is the struggle that Erasmus got himself into. Because I think he recognized very, very early on that uh, this this entry here, the longer reading of verse seven, is a problematic reading. Okay. It's a problematic uh, longer reading. Now, and, point, uh, point of clarity, just for a moment, for those who may not know, Erasmus's Erasmus was petitioned to take all the Greek manuscripts that he could get access to and put together a singular Greek version of the New Testament. That's correct. Okay, and, and that Greek version was used in part in the development of the King James translation. So when you when he Roy says Erasmus and his problems and challenges, that's that's what he's talking about. The guy that put together a Greek translation for yeah. them to work with. And, and, and of course, and it's actually really imperative for us to realize right. how valuable was the translation of Erasmus because what he actually does is he collates all of these different manuscripts. Uh, at pulling them, at least the known manuscripts, right. pulling them in, and and and, and creating a, uh, a a comparative translation that takes into account these. But because what he found was some variation, especially at chapter five, what we know as chapter five and verse seven. Remember, there is no chapter five and verse seven. Right. Uh, then his question was, well, where did this come from? And so the, since the preponderance of the manuscripts did not have it, and in fact the only ones that did were earlier, excuse me, were later manuscripts and not the earlier manuscripts, his option was to leave it out. Now Daniel, just I love the succinct fashion that Daniel said that Erasmus was, was, uh, had essentially said, well, show me a Greek manuscript that has it and I'll put it there. Well, lo and behold, that's exactly what what was given to him. So now it goes in. King James translators then picked that up and followed that forward. Okay. And uh, thus we have what we have in the King James. Now, okay, now later manuscripts, uh -huh. excuse me, not manuscripts, later translations 
have taken advantage of manuscript evidence that vastly transcends that which was available to Erasmus. Right. And so it's now much easier to determine what was the original reading. Right. There, there's there's four key manuscripts that were discovered from the third and fourth century That's correct. That, that have really opened up the eyes of translators. Um, still rejected by some, but by the majority is accepted. Uh, well, but Daniel, it, it, it's interesting that the, what, the most popular translation for hundreds of years, even after the language became dead, was the Latin Vulgate. Can I can I uh, can, can I reference one thing that is yes. in the quote that I put there uh, out of the Net Bible notes, and this this is one of the best presentations on the discussion uh, on the issue that that I've ever read, and I've I've read dozens of them down through the years. But one significant point is it said thus: there is no sure evidence of this reading in any Greek manuscript until the 14th century. And that manuscripts, that manuscript deviates from all others in its wording. The wording that matches what is found in the TR, the uh, Textus Receptus, was apparently composed after Erasmus's Greek text was published in 1516. Indeed, the comma, which is the uh, the uh, the insertion, mm -hmm. uh, appears in no Greek witness of any kind, either manuscript patristic or Greek translation of some other version until AD 1215 in a Greek translation of the Acts of the Lateran Council, a work originally written in, uh, in Latin. This is all the more significant since many a Greek father would have loved such a reading as it so succinctly affirms the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay. That is a profound statement. Okay. Daniel, let's throw to you. Any, any thoughts or comments? No, no. I think he's he's exactly right that you know one the first time it appears in Greek is twelve fifteen and it's not a Bible. Uh, I think that's profound. Uh, another thing that's profound is when we look at the external evidence. Um, <clears throat> Kurt Alland, which which if you have a, a Greek Testament, you might ha have heard of uh, the the oh. Nestle. Kurt Alland did a, a lot of work in in the head of, at the school in Munster, Germany. But he has a book on uh, textual criticism. The thing that he says is that first you look at the external evidence because it's unbiased. The facts are is that we look at the Greek evidence. That's what we look at. And it doesn't appear until 1215, and it's not even in a Bible, that it's there. So that's profound evidence that it's not there for 1,100 years after it was written. Um, in addition to that, I think that the uh, external evidence is great, but also we need to turn to internal evidence, and we've looked at that with verses 6 and verse 8, that it doesn't uh, seem to fit the context. In addition to that, something that textual critics do is they ask the question, why has it changed? Is it more realistic that this was added or more realistic that it was taken away? And the theory, uh, the most popular theory is that it, more things were added than omitted. People would notice something that was omitted but not as much added. Um, and so with this idea, if it is something of the Trinity in verse 7, the question is, why would anybody omit that? And wouldn't everybody notice that that's the verse that they go to to prove the, the Trinity, but, uh, you know, it's not there anymore. And so really there's no uh, motivation to omit this text, but there is strong motivation to include this text, especially when you have many of those who oppose uh, the teaching, maybe not finding a verse specifically that appeals to them to teach them the Trinity. By this text, you mean the uh, the Verse longer seven. reading? The longer reading, yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, and, and here's something else to think about too. We 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 have a, a preponderance of of I uh, probably not the proper word to use, but we ha we have an abundance of Bibles today. Okay, if someone comes out with the new translation, it's easy for any of us to sit down and start the comparison process. But during the time period of 600, 700, 800, 900, 1000, and, and so forth, you didn't have the common folk with the Bible. All right, and there weren't thousands upon thousands upon thousands of copies. As a matter of fact, in many of the monasteries, at least from, from the sources that I've studied, many of the, the monaster, monasteries and, and different things like that, 
they didn't have a complete Old Testament and a complete New Testament. Many of them would have maybe just the Psalms, or they would have the Old Testament in commentaries, or they would have parts of the New Testament in commentaries. And so it would not be very easy for the average person who got happened to get hold of, uh, of what was it, Latin, um, up until uh, the, we, we began to see English versions coming about, Mm -hmm. To be able to look at that and say, oh, here's something that I've not seen in the earlier copies. It would have been very easy for it to have been put into the text, and no one noticed it with except for those who were extremely studious um, in, in, in the epistle of John's. You know, whereas right. they, we, we could catch it like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But back then, it, it, it couldn't be caught. And anyone getting a new Bible, and I mean new, you know, newly printed and you know, done by hired and everything, they would just read it and not not realize that it was it was something new. Can right. I, can yeah. I a, yeah. Can I uh, uh, go ahead, Tom. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just going to make an observation based on what John's statement is, and and this is one of one of the wonderful things about the multitudes of translations. Now, I realize there's dangers because um, you know sometimes people when they create a new translation, you want to ask the question, what's your what's your motive? You know. Yeah. What, what are you trying to do? But but the, but the truth is is most of the literal translations, and that's your word for word, uh, not literal, but your word for word translations, mm -hmm. acknowledge these differences. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I I I think if I were to recommend somebody study the Bible, if if uh, the two things that I would give them as advice as resources is one, consult multiple translations, and number two. Learn how to use your column references, your center column references, your footnotes. They're okay. there for a reason. And, and, and the, the point that I'm making there is, is most versions today acknowledge the variance, the, the, the significant variance. Right. And, and that's a testament, because this is how we began this discussion today. That's a testament to the honesty of putting this together. We're, even though even though there are variants, we're, we're not trying to fight with each other over these things typically. It's, it's, a matter of, it's a matter of acknowledging, yeah, we know there's the differences out there, and we acknowledge those differences. But as was stated by Daniel at the beginning, there's nothing that cannot doctrinally be established in another passage that's in a variant. Yeah. Uh, I would like to say that... Uh, um, I agree that we should use, you know, references, pay attention to notes, but understand that some, for instance, in 1 John 5 and verse 7, I, I see notes like this. It'll have a, a number one by it. You go down to number one and you read the, the note that it has, and it says, some manuscripts include this. And it gives the impression that it's somehow divided or equal in the discussion. The fact is, the one we're talking about right now, 1 John 5 and verse 7, 8, 6 area, this is the biggest large passage blunder in English translation history. That's what it is. This is the biggest blunder because it's not there for so long. There's there's hardly any error uh, or, or any uh, omission or addition in the Greek text that comes later than this. Um, so this is not one of those, oh, scholars are divided, it's halfway. This is <laughs> just, why in the world is it in there? That's what this yeah. passage uh, right. comes to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but like, like, you know, I, I quote from the New King James, and the footnote on the New King James for this verse is... Uh, the NU and the M, which is references to different types of manuscripts and so on, uh, omit the words from in heaven, verse 7, through on earth, in verse 8. Only four or five very late manuscripts contain these words in Greek. And, and, and incidentally, a, a, part of, a part of understanding a center column reference is you've got to know the key to it, which means you've got to go to the front of your Bible, and you got to get the explanation. And, and I also need to say to that, as a word of caution, the, the center column references are put there by men, especially the reference scriptures and so on and so forth. Uh, but but you know, I, I'm just making the point that the differences are acknowledged. And like I said, you'll notice in the King James, they didn't use some, some don't use this. It 
says that there are versions that omit it. So but that's your, that's your specific yeah. Bible. That's yeah, exa Bible. exactly. And, I understand and, that. and some You're Bibles don't. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. And that's why I said use several Bibles. You me, use several Bibles in, in contrast. I think that's where study needs to begin. Okay. You know, it, when, you, when you come across a difficult passage, I, I think that's a good place to start is look at various versions that, and, and I, I've got to preface that with reliable versions because, okay. like, I, like I said, I've got to say that because there are versions out there that have agendas. And, uh, Royce, uh, know that. Okay. Let, okay, sorry. Uh, let's go back to Royce for just a moment here. What were you going to say while I go, Royce? I was just going to say, I'm going to make a really practical observation. I'm kind of glad that I held off and handed that over to Tom so that Daniel could make his statement. I, I don't disagree uh, with Daniel, but I would never, especially in the Bible class with people who are using a King James Version, charge that this was a colossal blunder. I, 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 I can see how it happened, even though... All of the it's only found in nine manuscripts, and four of those manuscripts have it in marginal notes. The phrase itself originated in an allegorical statement in in the context of a sermon for crying out loud. Uh, but I just would I would be really careful about saying something that someone might interpret as attacking the text itself, uh, and. I, I don't I, again. I don't disagree with uh, with Daniel. I, I and this may be my age uh, that that I would just I would want to be really careful that I wasn't leaving the impression that I thought verse seven, the extended reading or the longer reading of verse seven, was teaching something that was not true. And I know that's not what Daniel's saying. Right. Well, right. this is this is my viewpoint. So everybody knows where I'm coming from. Right. When I stand before the great God on Judgment Day, I'm going to be held accountable for every word that I have said. Correct. If I treat an uninspired text as if it is inspired, I will stand before God for that. And so I want to make clear that I do not believe in any way, shape, or form the added text is even remotely close to inspired text, and I will never treat it that way. And yeah. that's why I like to make that, that and I, statement. And I, and I do not disagree with that. The fact of the matter yeah. is, it is, it is irrefutably not a part of the original text. Right. Um, and, I, and, I just, and I would say I that. I just think when I'm dealing with someone who's using the King James Version and he's put his or her faith in the readings that they're uh, that they've made it that they've made out of this and they've based their obedience to the gospel upon it, I'm going to be extraordinarily careful to tiptoe through this and clarify that what I believe what 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 they believe on verse seven in the extended reading uh, right. is yeah. not wrong. It just doesn't belong there. Right. Yeah. And 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 the point I would make to that is, like I said, when you're in a class with with older people, and like I've said before, there's a very specific reason why I use the New King James Version. I won't go into that. But 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 the bottom line is, is you do not want to be in a class and tell somebody if you're using a King James, you're an apostate, and you don't want to leave that impression with a statement. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and that's why before we got into this discussion, we you know I talked to John and said, "Hey, what do you want to do in this format? This right. is obviously yeah. not a Wednesday night Bible class, um, exactly. or Sunday morning Bible class." So that's why I've made the comments that I have. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. Uh, could you bring up uh, the note on in the chat row uh, from Brian Haynes there? Uh, yep. And uh, Brian makes the statement, perhaps there's one point of contention by 1 John 5, 7, whether or not the Holy Spirit is in heaven. Now, I do not mean in any way the error of personal indwelling, some have, but the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the Word of God. He actually makes makes a pretty good observation right there in that connection. Uh, one, one final comment, uh, Daniel, and again, I, I don't want you to misunderstand I, I agree with exactly where you're coming from. I just isn't it interesting that when the King James translation is made in 1611, they choose the reading from Erasmus. That is, that is, 
you know, less than a hundred years old. You know, Erasmus is what, 15, what, turn, uh, turn of the 16th century, something like that, right after 1500. And then by 1611, then the King James translators drive a stake down and they just pin it for all, for all, all preachers in the future, all exegetes in the future to have to deal with. And uh, I, well, think they, I think it was they, a terrible disservice. The, well, the, I don't blame the King James translators because they just did what any good translator does in that you take the text that you're given and you translate it. That's their job. They had the Textus Receptus. All the, all the translators on there, their job was not to be textual critics and create a new uh, Greek New Testament. And, and so that's why I don't charge them, and that's why I do charge Erasmus because he knew better. Right. And, well, and, uh, there seems yeah. to be no question that Erasmus... Uh, cratered to the pressure. Yes. Yeah. Especially, yeah. especially in his third edition, which is right. where he actually, uh, where he actually uh, acknowledges the pressure that he re that he received. So. Right. And, and, and let's also not forget that the uh, King James was not the first English version either. Right. That actually the yeah. King James was a revision of what was it, the Bishop's Bible? Bishop's Bible. Yeah. 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 It, it, it was it was designed to be a a, a, a revision of that, along with Based on, based on the Greek or, or the original manuscripts that they had access to, which incidentally is why new translations come along. Good translations come along because of new discoveries in the original languages to make it as accurate as possible. I've got a, a, a chart in, in a book that lists the, uh, the various translations consulted when they did the King James. Right. And it wasn't simply the Greek; it was the Great Bible, the Bishop's Bible, right, right. which all preceded four or five others. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And there's actually which a all line. came from the Textus Receptus. <laughs> <laughs> well, some even before though, didn't they? Well, weren't some a translation of the of the Latin text of the Vulgate translation of the Vulgate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, could be. I'm not sure, um, but anyway, um, it, it it is a really really interesting discussion. I could remember, and, and uh, actually Daniel's dad can probably remember. How long has long's Randy been preaching, Daniel? How long did Daniel? Point. Um, I mean, he, he went into full-time work in like 1998. I or No, like I don't know when I was fourteen, so, okay, so about he, ten yeah, years but, ago. But I mean, okay, he's been well, most of his military service was preaching. Exactly. Okay. He, he did. Well, he did a great deal of preaching all throughout that. So I, I can tell you flatly that the the social dynamic connected to clarification um, about the uh, about the questionable status of the longer reading in First uh, John five seven. That's definitely changed over 25 years. Same with Mark 16:16 16, 16 and I, many I, others. I've noticed. Yeah. yeah I, I I I can remember when you just simply couldn't take that position. You know, you, you had so many people who followed, um, uh, you know, Foy Wallace and his preference, for instance, of the King James text, right. and you know, in in his review of the of the current versions, which is what 35, 40 years ago, something like that. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know they're, they're just people, just that were not really prepared to uh, to do that. I, and here again, I think it's imperative that as we go through this, we acknowledge that 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 is what some people have believed. You can get that out of other passages, as uh, as Tom correctly pointed out a little bit ago, but it doesn't belong in that passage. And, and I think it's interesting in, in that you know I've gone back and read some of the, some articles from different people throughout the years, and and a lot of times when you get a discussion like this, you might get somebody who says they're trying to take out the Godhead. They don't believe that. That's why they don't want this verse. That's and as dishonest. you can see from our discussion, exactly, yeah. that's not that's, an informed point whatsoever. That or, is dishonest. 
They, they don't believe this. And, uh, and I say misinformed because I don't know their motive. They may not know better. They may have been like me where you're just told things so many times that you repeat them and then you go and do your investigation and realize that has no basis in fact whatsoever as, as some of my young preaching was. And, and so that's why I don't, I, I don't know. Some people may view me as a very skeptical person, but I like to see the facts. Right. And to weigh the facts and see what it says. You so. sound like Jack Webb. Right, yeah, right, yeah. I think I just, right, yeah. I think I just yeah. dated myself. Yeah, yeah, I have no and, idea who and, he is. Yeah, and you, you might have to explain <laughs> that to Daniel. So, yeah, no, I, yeah, I was going to say, uh, that was Dragnet, by the way. Oh, okay. So, uh, th yeah, I think so you it, just it, dated uh, yourself, too. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. But, uh, yeah, I, I was also going to make the observation, yeah, and I guess it's time to wrap this up. But um, if you want to hear some of these arguments from the, the the standpoint of it having to be there and the King James, go visit some of these King James only sites. And I'm talking about the ones that are militant. Uh, I mean, I mean, you'll you'll see the arguments that they put out, and 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 uh, and, and honestly, a lot of them, a, a lot of them. Uh, Present a stronger case of why they're wrong, because of the way that they, <laughs> because of their militant um, attitude and and just the way that they'll twist words and so on. So, anyways. Okay, let's see. We are at twelve oh six. We need to go ahead and pull this to a close. Right. That's why I began the study by saying we believe in the Godhead. We believe yes. as specifically stated. And and I'll tell you, from a personal standpoint, the more that I have studied this particular verse, if I'm going to preach on the Godhead, I won't use this verse exactly. to, to support it. However, if there's a young preacher or even an older preacher that steps up there and preaches the Godhead, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and he hangs his whole sermon on this verse with cross-references spanning from it, I'm not going to correct him afterwards because the truth that he's teaching is still the truth. The truth. You know, mm -hmm. so it's fundamentally that, and that's what that goes back to the very beginning of the study here. You know, the truth is the truth. And so, you know, I won't use, I may not use this verse to try to prove right. this particular point. There are other verses that, that teach, that are inspired and establish it. But if someone reads, and, and we're not telling you to cut this out of your Bible. We're not telling you to get rid of your New King James Version and get an ESV. We're just telling you, you study it, you study the context of it, you know, and accept the translation for what it is, a translation, and look at the text and let the text explain for itself what it's teaching. Um, so, now, I believe next week, and y'all can be witnesses to this, we should probably start with verse 9 and talk about witnesses. Uh, let me make one observation. Okay. I just put a note in the chat roll uh, in, uh, about the King James only. This is an, I put a link there to a very excellent portal site uh, for okay. that. You might, wanna, you might want to bookmark that because they've got some fantastic links. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I've got that open up there now. All right. Let's, All go, right. let's go to witness. Yeah, um, and and bear in mind we, we do believe in the Godhead. That's you know, there there's no question about that. And if you can see in our teachings that we don't, let us know for sure. All right. So any final thoughts? We we will resume next Wednesday, Lord willing, there with verse nine and begin to build upon this. But Daniel, let's start oh, so with we're you. Not any... coming back. Never mind. Sorry. Let's see. How do I eject Tom from this room? Um, <laughs> you know, now, now, okay, with that being said, if someone has any questions or comments that maybe pertain to that, and, and if you want to write to us, and uh, we, we will definitely give consideration to that. You can send them to questions, Q-U-E-S-T-I-O-N-S, -S, questions at truthfactor.com, and we'll bring them into our study next week. Um, and also, I think, during the middle of the week, you can drop a comment in the chat room, and it'll still be there come our next study, I think. So, um, we definitely like to hear from you, though. All right, um, Daniel, any thoughts? I'll just say I appreciate everybody's time in, in this discussion, and, and I appreciate the forum that's open for us to talk about this stuff. And as it has been stated by everyone else, I, I too, believe that, you know, if, if somebody, uh, you know, 
in a Bible class was discussing uh, 1 John chapter 5, 6 through 8. I don't think that this much detail would be merited, but uh, I think that we also need to be careful in picking and choosing our battles. If we have somebody who's, who's a strict KJV only, Guess what? I could teach the truth out of the King James version, you know. I, and so uh, we we just we need to emphasize fellowship in this. That you know, if somebody wants to use a KJV, I'm not going to disfellowship from them. Uh, right. I may not believe everything they particularly point out. Just like when it comes to the plan of salvation. You know, uh, there's a, a, a verse for baptism and a verse for confession that I don't particularly use uh, because I think it's it's not in the context. But that doesn't mean I don't believe in those aspects. And so we each have to go by our own information, what we know, uh, and we have to be accountable for uh, ourselves on Judgment Day. And so our job is not to convince everybody to believe as we believe, but to show God's Word and to bring people to the truth of it. That's right, and yes. and this is a discussion, and we're studying through First John, so we're going to take a deeper look at things, mm -hmm. which merits the type of discussion we've had today. All right, Royce, any thoughts? Uh, I I think it's been an excellent study. I I appreciate the uh, the gentle, um, uh, not so much a disagreement, but but at least uh, uh, contrast uh, on approaches in teaching this. I, I think it's important that we realize how valuable is uh, that kind of a contrast to to sharpen us, to uh, to make us better thinkers, to make us better presenters of the Word. It's been an excellent study. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, same here. Tom? Um, I, I echo those remarks. Uh, we still treat each other as brethren in these things. And incidentally, forgive our occasional jesting. I mean, do, do not interpret that as, as a not taking the Word of God seriously because I mean uh, the whole the whole title of this study is truth factor and and our goal is to factor the truth is just we in our humanity sometimes we bring out you know we'll bring out points in a satirical or a, or a, a humorous way we might even banter with one another and uh, we intentionally do not edit that out you know because uh, uh, but but ultimately it's it's about getting the word of God right. Yeah, we're trying to have a truth-filled study, not a mistake-less study. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All righty. Well, thank you so much for joining us for our study this week. Well, Lord willing, we will uh, be able to continue this discussion starting there with verse um, nine next Wednesday. Um, hopefully, you can join us. So let's let's plan next Wednesday at, at uh, verse nine. There, we'll start at. 11 o'clock Central Time. 9 o'clock so Pacific Daniel. Time. Oh, sorry. Uh, it'll be noon Eastern Time. Okay. All right. Now, Tom. 9 o'clock Pacific Time. And Royce? Same thing here in San Bernardino, too. <laughs> Pacific. Right here at live.truthfactor.com. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>